Welcome to the Clinical Podcast Series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation and the Public Health Channel. Today's episode is Update on Myopia Control, the U.S. Perspective. I'd like to thank our host and topical editor, Ruth Hyatt, and topical expert, Timothy Tsang. Now on with the show. Hi, I'm Ruth Hyatt, a fellow and clinical diplomate of the Academy. This is the Clinical Podcast Series. Today's episode will evaluate myopia control. Our topical expert is Tim Sang. Hey, Tim, can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Um, So I used to be a faculty at uh, Illinois College of Optometry before moving back to uh, the greater Toronto area in Canada. And I'm currently in full school private practice. um, And we train uh, clinical externs from the University of Waterloo, as well as the Illinois College of Optometry um, Uh, fourth year OD students. Okay, so let's have a look at our paper. So the update on myopia control, the US perspective was published in Eye and Contact Lens by Michelle Ray in 2022. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over two definitions for this paper. They defined high myopia as greater than five diopters. And they emphasize that myopia control is a delay or slowing down of myopia progression with a goal of decreasing ocular morbidity associated with myopia, such as glaucoma and retinal detachment. So it's not just the reducing the use of spectacle and contact lenses. All right. So Tim, I have to start off by asking, I'm a high myope. I turned out fine. Why do I care about myopia control and what can we do about it? So that's a great question, Ruth. Um, Really, one of the landmark studies was published in 2015 by our colleagues in Australia out of the uh, Dr. Hoard and Dr. Frick's group. Um, And that publication uh, really put myopia um, at the forefront of this epidemic that's that's basically creeping up on us. And um, I believe that paper that's referenced um, in in this article is that uh, it's projected on average that half the world will be myopic by the year 2050. that publication specifically was saying that 23% of the global population already has some level of myopia and 4% is considered high myopia, which is, as you've mentioned, defined as now minus five doctors or greater of spherical equipment refractive error. Um, The burden really, I think, of myopia and vision impairment is that we know that the higher the myopia, the greater the risk of uh, vision impairment or sight-threatening vision loss namely glaucoma, cataracts, but more so retinal detachment and myopic maculopathy, where the risk is not linear, but actually exponential. Um, and so in 2019, as a follow-up, Dr. Bullimore and Dr. Brennan, uh, they published in Optometry and Vision Science. Um, and, uh, the, the gist of that paper was that every doctor of myopia saved reduces the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40%. Um, and that's a very important um, uh, finding because even if the patient's a minus three or minus six doctor uh, myo, uh, you are still reducing uh, the risk of uh, uh, ocular sequelae or downstream effects of high myopia um, by reducing every doctor. Um, so every doctor counts essentially. Um, I think the other point of discussion um, has been whether or not to even categorize myopia or call it a disease. Um, especially since there are clear associations uh, with increased risk of sight-threatening diseases, um, and especially since nowadays we have uh, effective measures and treatments to combat or slow the progression of myopia. Okay, and how should we measure and track myopia and myopic progression? So uh, what's nice is like, similar to how blood sugar is measured in diabetes, uh, control blood pressure and hypertension, IOP and glycoma care. We now have the ability to um, measure biometry or axial length myopia, and it's really become a mainstay and crucial in assessing uh, control and tracking progression risks beyond simply uh, prescription and refraction um, or spherical equivalent refraction. Um, the reason being is that um, uh, increased axial length or higher starting points um, are associated with an increased odds ratio of high myopia which in turn leads to the um, uh, previously mentioned uh, visual or sight-threatening conditions, um, especially later in life. Um, moreover, nowadays, uh, there have been uh, a lot of development in normative growth charts that are continuously being studied and developed uh, to help standardize the normative values and axial length measures. Um, 
Dr. Tyman's group in 2018 published axial length growth charts for European children. I believe it was UK and Netherlands. And Dr. Diaz in 2019 uh, published axial growth charts for Chinese population of pediatrics. So these are now commonly implemented in some of the software tools available to track um, axial length. Um, again, in our practice, axial length is now a mainstay in guiding um, the need for combination therapy or which therapy to begin with. Um, and we have multiple options worldwide as far as um, uh, what we can use to implement that. Um, I think the more uh, another important point is um, the World Council of Optometry now um, encourages optometrists to embrace a standard of care to manage myopia progression worldwide. Um, and currently, I think I, I, I believe that the evidence all points towards biometry or axial length measure as a mainstay or part of that standard moving forwards. So now that we know the impact of myopia and why it's important, what therapeutic treatment options do we have at our disposal? So in the U.S., um, the MySight soft daily contact lens is a, a disposable hydrogel daily lens. It remains, I believe, the only approved um, myopia control soft contact lens that's FDA approved. Um, Orthal keratology, it's been widely used for decades as a form of off-label myopia control. I think that's only because the FDA approved it in 2002 for myopic refractive error with overnight wear, um, but it's been shown to be quite effective and there are plenty of studies to back that up. Um, topical atropine has been shown to be an effective option. It's been studied extensively, although uh, the exact mechanism um, remains to be fully elicited. Uh, there are potential side effects, including photophobia, blurred vision, um, especially at near. Um, and um, we have to make sure that uh, the, the, the child doesn't have any systemic contraindications um, to start uh, um, atropine. It's also becoming a little bit more commercially available in certain parts of the world. Um, in other parts of the world and in Canada where we practice, uh, spectacle lens options have really um, exploded as far as uh, a, a good and pragmatic option for younger age groups who might not be able to uh, wear Orso K or uh, myopic control contact lenses. And that includes three types of technology right now, the DIMS, HALT, and DOT technologies um, um, by their respective companies. And they aim to slow down myopic progression through peripheral myopic defocus or a reduction in peripheral hyperopic defocus, um, as well as um, contrast sensitivity. Um, so uh, contrast sensitivity and peripheral myopic defocus seem to be the two prevailing um, theories. On, in slowing down um, myopic progression. Um, more recently, there are studies looking at choroidal thickening. And so OCT is being done to measure choroidal thickness uh, and as well as the effect of certain light therapy and dopamine in, in levels of the retina. Um, but those are ongoing studies. And um, most treatment options, whether it's myopia controlled lenses, um, contacts, orthokeratology or atropine, um, we're looking at spherical equivalent refractive error um, and axial length reduction by at least 50%, oftentimes more, um, from the current studies. So it really seems natural, I think, for us to gravitate to these more effective options um, that have really minimal side effects uh, and risks to the patient population that we're trying to treat. Um, the last point would be probably uh, it's important to not neglect or overlook uh, lifestyle modifications. So we know that therapeutic options exist, but uh, we do know that there's genetic hereditary risk factors, as well as reduced time spent outdoors. Um, and so I, I like to encourage patients um, uh, where we can address modifiable risk factors, like the amount of time spent on air activities and screen time, as well as time spent outdoors, um, because we know that there is direct association independently uh, or uh, along with uh, uh, the modifiable risk factors as far as myopic progression are concerned. Well, Tim, I appreciate your insight and thank you for contributing to this episode. And I wanted to thank the listeners as well for this episode of the clinical podcast series. My pleasure. And thank you for the invitation.